Vikings. And uh, as always, it's good to have you um, as we discuss some, some things that, well, there are people who uh, would consider them outlandish, uh, heresy, blasphemy, whatever. Um, but I think given the condition of the world and the things that we've seen uh, over these 2,000 years of religion or more, um, many people are coming to the conclusion that we have been following a wrong concept. Religion basically is um, a very uh, unfortunately uh, evil concept. Um, it causes people to form into clans, um, tribes if you would. And as such, once you get involved in a group, <clears throat> it, it, it hardly makes any difference what group it is. Once you get involved in this group, then you automatically, through your nature, start to begin supporting the beliefs of that group. It doesn't make any difference if they're wrong. Uh, it doesn't make any difference if somebody else comes along and says, hey, uh, you know, this is, this is wrong. You'll, you'll start really to, to hang on to, to your group. It's, it's like a security blanket. And if you look at all of the groups, you have religious groups, you have social groups, you have national groups, now you have militia groups, you have countries, and uh, they form into, form into these clans and they war with one another. And that's, that is the essence of the problems of the world. It is people lacking the ability or the understanding of becoming individuals and then communing with nature which is the God who dwells within them. Instead, they are communing with an interpretation of a God. Uh, what is, you know, if you belong to a church, what is your faith in? Your faith in is what your church told you, and, and that's the opinion of a person. And, and that person got it from somebody else's opinion. And it all traces itself back to a Bible which nobody knows who wrote it, and, and much of it is, is Greek mythology. And, and this is your belief, and, and you'll go to war over these beliefs. Just about every war that's ever been fought has religion at the basis of it. And in addition to that, when you take the tenets of religion, uh, they don't understand sex. Sex is to be used to breed. And they'll march at abortion clinics, but at the same time, uh, they're the ones who are saying, uh, you can't use contraceptives. So they create the problem, and then they march with their flags as if, oh, this is horrible. They've created the mess because they haven't accepted sex, for instance, as a joyous thing between male and female so that it can be talked about openly, that children can be guided in it. No, they've made it a dirty, filthy thing, and, and children are warned from it. Uh, people are, are warned that the only time they can use it is to make babies and all this kind of stuff. And, and it's lunacy. Now you've got the religious right and you've got a bunch of fraud, uh, Pat Robertson's group is, is coming out and, and is going to heal everything. And, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to make his religious beliefs the law. That's what the religious right is. I mean, don't make it sound like it's a bunch of conservative peoples who are Christian. It's not. It's Pat Robertson's group and this guy, Reed, who, who fronts for it. And, and what they are trying to do is make the philosophies of Pat Robertson law. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Can you imagine such a thing? The only place I know where it's comparable today is in uh, Iraq and Iran. That's basically where you have uh, these fundamentalists who, who run a country. I mean, in, and this is what uh, we're supposedly allowing to you know, tell us how rotten we are. Uh, it, it's, it's a sick institution. Religion is a sick, violent institution that separates people from one another, makes people suspicious of one another, and has just made an absolute mess out of the world. So we come to you from the New Age Christian Village Church. You say, well, gee, that sounds like religion. Well, it's not. It's a premise on each person finding within themselves that, that touch of nature, that touch of God that directs their lives. It's allowing people to individuate, as Carl Jung said it. And that's the problem. You've got to find this guidance within yourself. You don't need a group. You don't need a church. You don't need religion to tell you which way to turn. Because basically, 
When you have that, all you have is a bunch of goals that are set up by some group or some people say, oh, you're coming up short. You don't have enough faith. You're not following this. You're not following that. And then you go into a guilt. You go into a, do a depression. And when you go into a depression, you get a sickness. And all of this is caused by religion. I don't know of anything that is more destructive to the human psyche than religion. It's a horrible thing. As I remember doing the, the explosion in Oklahoma when they had the uh, service and Billy Graham stood up there at the end of the service and said, why did these things happen? And, and nobody knew why. And he didn't know why. And, 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 the, and, the, and the point is simply, so we have put into the heads of children these violent concepts and religion's part of it. Very nationalistic. If you really want to get in with God, with nature, you can't be a nationalist. You, you, you can't even be patriotic. You've, you've got to start looking at the universe. God bless the universe has to be the new cry, the new soul. Let me tell you that we have a phone here, and the telephone number is 609-971-0537, and you can call, leave your number, and we'll get back to you whenever. Um, uh, you know, well, I mean, we'll get back to you on the phone. You leave your name and you leave your address and we'll send you information about this. But this, this is a, a tremendous time, in spite of all of the lunacy uh, that is caused by the people who belong to the tribes and the clans of the world. Uh, so many people are finding this within themselves. It's what Jesus talked about. The kingdom is within you. So over the next few weeks, I thought what we would do is we'd look at some of the some of the ideas and some, some things maybe people haven't heard before uh, from a little booklet that I put together called Secrets, which you can have for 12 bucks. It's a commercial. Um, right, listen. Um, but maybe, maybe it would be good, maybe it would be good for you to have this booklet in your house and, and you could sit with people who are trying to dredge into us this thing of, oh, you've got to get saved. The hell with it. Excuse the expression. Because this is such a self-centered type of philosophy of I'm saved and, and you know kids are starving kids are being blown up animals are being mistreated nature itself is being raped as I'm saved I'm going to heaven well if there can you imagine any worse fate I mean you, you what is hell hell is is spending the entire eternity in, in an unfortunate place here's where you would go and spend the rest of your life with with a with a world populated by born again fundamentalists I mean that's, that's, that's about as close to hell as you can get because the, the constant fighting, the constant finger pointing, the constant guilt by association, the constant guilt for communing with nature, the misunderstanding of nature. I mean, who, who wants to live in that type of thing? How could that conceivably be considered heaven? So let's, let's, let's take up some questions. And once again, the phone number is 609-971-0537. Let's take up some questions. Um, oh, if you're watching this, now, if you're, if you're not in New York City, or if you're not watching this on Time Warner Cable in New York, disregard this next announcement, okay? Please. But if you are watching this in New York, uh, I will be in New York City, and we're going to have a meeting. We're going to be speaking. Saturday, June the 24th, Saturday, June 24th, 7.30 p.m., 233 Fifth Avenue at the corner of 27th Street, and I'll announce that a little later, okay? But here, let's take a look at, like I said, some of the questions from, from the Secrets booklet that I put together, and let's see if we can come up with something, and um, let's see if we can exchange some ideas, and let's not be afraid to question anything. Let's question Jesus' existence, Jesus' death. Let's question virgin birth. Let's, que let's question everything. It doesn't mean we're denying anything, but let's question it. Let's, let's have the courage to stand up and talk about it. Say, hey, wait a minute. You know, this doesn't make any sense to me. Say, and and uh, what, what we've been so far controlled by is religious institutions that say, oh, you're not allowed to question this. Oh, great, you know, this is terrific. Uh, you know, here we're talking about being in bondage, being controlled. We're controlled by religious institutions that have actually been the authors of violence and, and guilt and fear and all this crap, excuse me. And let's see if we can somehow find a pathway to, to be able to have a dialogue about things and say, Let, let's get his people. <coughs> so he said, I quit your organization. I quit your church. I quit your religion. I'm, gonna, I'm really going to find God for a change. I'm not going to find your opinion about what God is. My faith is not going to be based 
on your interpretation of some books that were written by people who nobody knows who they were, who most of it is written in Greek mythology. So, I mean, you know, let's, let's, get, to, let's get back to nature and let's get back to a part where we can understand and love people. We, we don't degrade women as religion does. We don't degrade uh, gays and lesbians as religion does. We don't degrade nature <clears throat> and animals as religion does. What, what, place, what place does religion have for animals? They don't ever mention it. All uh, animals are just, uh, you know, we're to subdue them. The bull, okay, your dog, your cat is a person. A person whom whose spirit comes into your house and then touches you. It, your dog, your cat is your only link to God. Your only link to God. You can't have a link to God in a Bible. You can't have a link to God uh, in, in, in a church, in a place with some guy with robes and glass windows and, and, and stone and they're singing all these songs in the 1400s. You can't have a link of God. You have a link with God when you pick up your dog, you pick up your cat. The eyes touch your eyes and all of a sudden something happens and you open a mystique. You open a magical journey. That's God. See? They don't understand that. These people have no knowledge of the part that people, uh, uh, that, that our four-legged people play in our lives. And that's why, you know, I just encourage you, become an individual. Start meditating. Start entering in within yourself. Start seeking understanding. And you'll find it in the Bible. You'll find it in the scriptures. But you won't find it in the literalism of, of, of religion. So uh, here's the phone number again, 609-971-0537. Just leave your name and address, and we'll send information to you, okay? Um, mm. Let's, let's take a question that is the fundamental basis of Christianity, which is our Western heritage religion. And the question is, did Jesus Christ die for your sins? Okay. This premise really, really bothers me, really has always turned me off. And I'll tell you why it turns me off. If Jesus Christ had to die for my sins, first of all, what sins? Define it. I mean, let's define what the sins are. Uh, did I say some bad words? Did I go to Atlantic City? Did I have sex? Did I smoke? Did I have... What is it? You know. And the second thing is, does this set a premise that there is somewhere a God who created this whole nightmare and he has started this uh, road to, uh, uh, you know, destruction by coming up with the idea that his only possible way of being able to forgive you is if he resorts to violence and kills somebody. He can't forgive you unless he resorts to violence. Then, if that's the premise, we know why we are the way we are, don't we? We're no better. I mean, he's no better than we are. How could, how could he be any better than us if he can't solve his problems without turning to violence? Not only does he kill this guy, Jesus, but in addition to killing, he uses innocent people to do the killing for him. He uses the Roman soldiers. He uses the Jewish people. He uses Pontius Pilate. None of these people know anything. They don't know what's going on here. They don't know that they're, they're hit men for God. They're going to kill uh, this Jesus so that you can be saved. What kind of a joke is this? Let me tell you this. Let me tell you where this comes from. Okay? The fact that Jesus is crucified is Greek mythology. It comes out of astrology. And it comes from the point that on December the 21st, the sun enters the constellation, the cross. The sun is crucified on December the 21st. It is the shortest day of the year. There is more darkness on the face of the earth on December the 21st than any other day in the year. That's why the story portrays Jesus as the sun god who is crucified. If the sun on December the 21st entered into the constellation Taurus, the bull, then the story would have had it been rewritten. Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. Jesus would have been gored by a bull. It's astrology, cosmology, that's why. Otherwise, this is your problem. You've got something called God, who is your heavenly Father, who is the creator of all things, and who cannot figure a way out of his dilemma of how to forgive you unless he resorts to violence and has somebody killed. The heavenly godfather, it sounds like, right? Okay.
So then we come back to this, did Jesus uh, die for you? Since now, let's take and define another part uh, of the problem. We, we, we've addressed this thing about why the crucifixion, because the sun comes through uh, the constellation, the cross on December the 21st. There's another point of this. The crucifixion then involves the, the light of the solar plexus, the energy of the solar plexus, which is the sun within you, which must be crucified or killed so that the energy then can rise up to the Father's house and sit at the right hemisphere of the brain, which is sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's what that means, okay? The point you can find it in the Bible is that the uh, tip that this is a question of consciousness and something that happens in the mind is that Jesus is crucified in Golgotha. And the word Golgotha means skull. In your head is the crucifixion. In your psyche is the crucifixion. In your soul is the crucifixion. In your mind, in your spirit is the crucifixion. That's where this takes place. Okay, so we're not talking about literally somebody has to be killed in order to appease some guy. That's human sacrifice. And then they'll talk about pagans, and that's what their whole religion is based on. Now, let's define the second part of this. Let's define the word sin, okay? Sin is the name of the moon god of Ur of the Chaldees. There's a town called Ur, U-R, in a place called the Chaldees, which is an ancient place where the patriarch Abraham lived. And the god of that particular area was called Sin. Okay, Sin was the moon god. Now, the mythology, the metaphysical part of this starts to open itself to understanding. The moon, what does the moon do? The moon reflects the light. Whatever light is shown on it, it will reflect. And that's what is considered to be um, equal to the emotions. The human emotions reflect on to other people what is shown. If you are in peace, you will reflect peace. If you are turmoil inside, you will reflect turmoil outside. If there is confusion given to you, you will reflect confusion. If there is fear given to you, you will reflect fear. So that's sin. It has nothing to do with drinking, has nothing to do with sex, has nothing to do with smoking. Religion has made all of these things in order to keep people in fear and keep people in bondage. It has nothing to do with these things. Sin means the emotions. When you are dwelling in the fear and the chaos of your emotions, you are dwelling in sin. So it says then, did Jesus Christ die for your sins? See, the answer is in a metaphysical and mystical way that Jesus died, okay, died to free you from your emotions. Now, how does this happen? It happens this way. In John 14 and 20, Jesus says, At that time you will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. What is he? He's the Son God. He is the Son of God. He is the energy of the solar plexus. He dies. When you meditate, you separate from the thoughts of the mind. When you separate from the thoughts of the mind, the energy, which is that which is in the solar plexus, is the life energy, the emotion energy, the, the ego energy, dies. That spiritual energy then rises up to sit at the right hemisphere of the brain. It rises up to sit at the right hand, quote, unquote, of the Father and the Mother God. So then, if Jesus is in you, and if Jesus portrays that solar energy, that sun energy within you, when Jesus dies, then the Christ rises and you are saved from your emotions. So you are saved from your emotions by separating from the thoughts of the mind. That is a challenge in and of itself. Try to separate from your thoughts for 30 seconds. You know, stop for 30 seconds and try to see if you can separate from your thoughts and you'll see how totally out of control you are. You have no control over it at all. And why? Because you've been scared to death by your parents. You've been scared to death by your church. You've been scared to death by schools. You're scared to death by your government. You're scared to death by the entire makeup of that which we call the social order of the world, which is a sick mess because of religion and these types of structures which, which govern by fear and guilt. There is, there is, I mean, <laughs> here we have, you have a lot of these, like Ralph Reed and Pat Robertson and all of these wacky people coming out and saying, we want to return to the traditional family. 
evil. There is nothing more evil in the world except religion than the traditional family. Why? Because what is the premise of the traditional family as defined by organized religion? The premise of the traditional family as described by organized religion is that the woman must submit to the man. They just had a conference of 10,000 men trying to retain their manhood. What that means is trying to retain their place of dominating women. It's an evil. Say. And this is what we're supposed to return to. This is what the religious right thinks is wonderful. The woman stays home, darns socks, and stirs soup, and nursemaids kids, while the man runs off and um, goes out and has a career. Now, wait a minute. Are you saying... Uh, we shouldn't have somebody stay home? Certainly, somebody should be home. But it may be the man who stays home and, and darns the socks and stirs the soup while the woman goes off. It has to be a 50-50 co-partnership. And one of two things has to happen. One, people get married, they decide we're not going to have any kids. Two, if they decide that they're going to have kids, then they have to decide in advance how are they going to take care of them. Who's going to stay home? Is it going to be the woman? Is it going to be the man? Are they going to have a, a nursemaid? They're going to have daycare. What are they going to have? Some way, there has to be a return to a non-traditional family, a non-patriarchal family, in which there is a co-partnership between the male and the female. One does not submit to the other. That's the evil of religion. So when we say, did Jesus die for our sins, Jesus was killed by what? According to the script, by religion. When you try to find the Christ who is within you, religion will try to kill it out of you. Because the, there, there is a threat to religion. If you find that the Christ is in you, what do you need them for? And then they don't exist. And the money drains. And the control drains. And all of the, the, the television movie stars, that are, television stars that they have with their slick hair and their Bibles and their songs and all of that. Who needs that stuff when you have a communion with nature within you? So when Jesus is killed, when that essence is killed within you, see, then you rise and you find your individuality within yourself. Jesus Christ is according to the book, according to the word, gave his life so that you and I could find what religion tries to hide from you. The fact that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of nature, the kingdom of the universe of good and of healing is within you, and you don't need all of that fear. You don't need all of that guilt. You don't need all of those rules and regulations. Sorry. And Jesus in the scriptures made it clear that you had to follow his words. You had to enter within yourself. And if you did that, you would find salvation from what? From fear, from guilt, and yes, from religion itself. So we are saved from our emotions when we obey Jesus. But your church, your religion is going to be the group that's going to say, don't obey him. Because this is what he said. Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. In other words, if you practice the single eye, the single eye is Hindu, the single eye is Buddhic, the single eye is raising yourself in a conscious realm above the thoughts of the mind. And religion will tell you that's evil. So that's the, who's the Antichrist then? Surprise, surprise, it's religion. It's the church that doesn't want you to do the things that Jesus said to do so that you could be saved. When you take no thought, when you separate from the thoughts of the mind, you're separating from guilt, you're separating from tradition, you're separating from your patriotism, you're separating from your allegiances to your groups and your organizations, you're separating from all of that. You come into yourself and you seek a communion with the kingdom, you seek a harmony with nature within yourself, and you get rid of all of that, excuse the expression, crap that has come from religion and, and social institutions that say you must do this and you must do that. Look at 2,000 years of you must. Look at 10,000 years of you must, and it's a complete blur. All it is is a violent nightmare, and it's wrong, and it's evil. And so what Jesus taught are the very things that caused the story account of him to lead to his death, coming against religion. The things that religion regards as evil today, finding that which is within yourself, practicing the single eye, separating from the thoughts of the mind. Those are the things that the story tells us Jesus was killed for. His teachings of inner harmony with all things that have the breath of life and grow in the magnificence of God's universe are the things that your religion warns you away from. Or they say, follow us, do what we say, get saved, and everything is getting wrecked. 
So think of that. Think of that when you, when you talk within yourself. Think of it when you talk with your friends. Try to, for the first time in your life, maybe close the door. Maybe you can't do it in front of your friend, but try to close the door somewhere and say, gee, what is this all about? And look at the mess. Look at the violence. Look at the kids on drugs. Look at all of this stuff. And yet we've had all of these years of religion. Maybe, just maybe, we've been following wrong teachings. And you can bet that you are because the teachings that we've been following that come from Christianity per se come out of the dark ages of Europe. That's where they come from. A misinterpretation of Greek mythology which is the New Testament. The New Age... Where did everything begin? Where and how did it all start? That's what we want to, that's what we want to kind of kick around. Where the heck did it all begin? Now, there is a movement afoot. Many people in the, you know, born again, fundamentalist uh, persuasion to get the teaching of creation science into the public schools taught alongside of evolution science. But The only document on the face of the earth that has anything in it about creation science is the Bible. Now, here's the problem with it. These are the prime characters in the story that have to deal with creation. First of all, you have a primordial area, some type of area of vegetation, Garden of Eden called. And strangely enough, in this primordial existence, if we're going to get this into the schools as as science, you have two English people, Adam and Eve. Okay, what are two English people with English names doing in a primordial garden, literally millions of years ago, thousands of years ago at the least? What are they doing? Now, the basis of the story of Genesis, which we're going to try, or or people are trying to get into the public schools as creation science, is that these people ate an apple or ate a piece of fruit and screwed up the whole world, caused rapes, pillaging, drug addiction, cancer, atomic warfare, everything, because they ate a piece of fruit off of a tree that they would have never known where it was in the first place unless somebody told them. In other words, There was 10 billion trees. There was one tree they couldn't eat from. They didn't know where it was. But this one called God said, wait, I want to show you something. They got in the Jeep, drove uh, through the forest. He said, see that tree over there? I want you to eat that one because you'll get smart. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, what are they going to do? This is the story. We're going to this is creation science. Now, these people, according to this story, are naked. They don't have any clothes on. But the thing is, they don't know it. They don't know. They don't have any clothes on. Suddenly they find out that they don't have any clothes on. Guess who tells them? A talking snake. Okay? A talking snake tells them, you don't have any clothes on. Woohoo! What's that down there? Oh, they don't have any clothes on. And the talking snake tells them that they don't have any clothes on. Okay. This is what you want to introduce into public schools to put in along with evolution science, creation science. Two English people eating fruit, screwing up the whole universe, didn't know they didn't have any clothes on until they were told by a talking snake who happened to be passing through. What he was doing, selling something, going from tree to tree, selling goods or what, I don't know. But anyhow, he told them, hey, you don't have any clothes on. Oh, this screws the whole thing up. This is what literalists want to bring into the school. Say, we've got to teach this along. This is creation science. Okay. I think the first thing you ever do is whenever you see a story and there's a talking snake in it, it may not be true. You know, I, it, may, it may not be an accurate story. See, there's a phone ringing and then somebody just answered the machine and it's 609-971-0537. If you want to call up about the talking snake, you can call. Now, Genesis 1 introduces us to these two English people. Forget the two English people. Forget Adam. Okay? You have to understand all of this stuff is allegorical. Okay? That means that it's all symbolic. It doesn't mean there was really two people in this garden. There wasn't. Let me tell you where this comes from. 
in a place called Memphis, Egypt. And you can look this up. The creation there brought forth the first man. His name was Atom. Atom. A-T-U-M. Now look at something very interesting. If we close the U, look what you got. Atom. Okay? All right. So I'm introducing you to the origin of everything. Now the thing is, this is not going to sit well with religionists and fundamentalists and born-again people, and I'll tell you why. Because it makes sense. And that's off limits. Okay? But that's the origin of all life. And you know what? It's true. Atom. Now, if you're going to write an allegory, you're going to write a symbolic story, and you want to have a man represent Atom, what would you call him? Why? I think I'd call him Atom. A-D-A-M. Adam. Adam. Okay. Now, how do we know that Adam, A-D-A-M, and Atom, A-T-U-M, are really our friend from the nuclear plant, Atom, A-T-O-M? There's a way we know. Scientifically, if you remove an electron from an A-T-O-M, Atom, you multiply the energy. Got it? Okay. Look at this. What did they say happened to our friend Adam? In order to multiply the species, they removed a rib. So then allegorically, in the very first book of the Bible, allegorically and symbolically, it's saying that all life began from the splitting of the atom. A-D-A-M, A-T-O-M, A-T-U-M, call it any way you want. That's what's being said. And you know what? It makes sense. So that excludes our religious friends, because they don't want to deal with anything like that. Now, let's go to the location where um, these two English people reside, Adam and Eve. Now, we've, got, we've, we, we've gotten to the beginning of everything, right? We've gotten to Adam. That's the beginning, and we know we've identified it as Adam. But actually, in reality, what is being said in the book is that the beginning of life starts with the atom. Okay? You, you shouldn't have any problem with that because it's true. You know? Well, you know, what I'm saying to you is, if there is such a thing as God, then it's got to be provable. It's got to be provable. Or else, uh, you know, it's silly. Now, the dwelling place of these people... Because what we've got here, we've got Adam and Eve. And let me, let me just break down the names as to why we have these two people. Adam, we know what that means. That's, that's the physical. And that is exactly what it says, A-T-O-M, A-D-A-M, Adam. Eve, the word Eve, means life-giving spirit. It's spirit, it's mind, it's thought process. Okay? That's what Eve represents. So you didn't have two people in the garden. You didn't even have a garden, to tell you the truth. You had actually the evolution out of the atom. When the atom was split, you then had the evolution into that which was the physical as well as the mental, and you called it Adam and Eve. Spirit, mind, which produces thought. Okay. Now, the dwelling place initially of the human mind, human consciousness, is in Eden, which means the Garden of Delight, the place of delight, Eden. I mean, it's a place of spelling, E-D-E-N, okay? Now, there's an interesting point to show the location of Eden and to identify it as a location of something within us. It says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Whenever you look to the north, east is always on the right. So that this garden of delight is located at the right side, or what you would know in vernacular as the right hemisphere of the brain. So the right hemisphere of the brain becomes the dwelling place of that which is original spirit and mind and physical aspect. There's a oneness, they're dwelling at the right side. That's why it's eastward in Eden, 
Okay? There never was two people named Adam and Eve that dwelled in any place named Eden. This is all psychology. It is psychology, and it comes in an evolutionary way through the splitting of the atom, the introduction of the physical and the mental, and then a dwelling in the right hemisphere of the brain, which is the creative side, the God side, from whence we were kicked out, and now we use the left hemisphere of the brain. Okay? All right. So, the Lord God plants this garden in Eden or this place of delight, and initially all mankind dwelled there, but there's a problem with that. And the problem with that is we then have no choice. We haven't reached that point where we become quote-unquote godlike. We're walking around, we are eating figs or dates or whatever it is, and it's not a whole lot of challenge and not a whole lot to be accomplished by human beings because they're living at the right hemisphere, which is totally under the control of nature, so that's not such a good idea. So then we have to introduce to you the next character in our drama, which will then take the evolution of the mind into the realm of choice, and this is the serpent. Okay. Now the serpent actually is none other than the human spine. And it represents desire of the physical. There was not a, come on, I mean, you know, Jesus. There was not a talking snake. I think we all, you know, we're not, we, we really know there was, you do know that. You don't really believe that there was a talking, you know there wasn't, okay? Because if you believe there's a talking snake, we're not going to get anywhere. If, on the other hand, you understand how these things were written allegorically and symbolism, and, you know, it, it's, it would be easy for me to say, well, you know, I believe that this is all symbolism, that's not fair to you, because then I have no right coming up and saying that. But, I mean, Psalm 78, 2 says, God speaks in parables. Proverbs 1, 6, wisdom is understanding the dark sayings, which is parables, allegories, symbolism, numerology. Mark 4, 11 says, Jesus never taught but in a parable. Uh, 1 Corinthians, I forget exactly where it was. The Apostle Paul said, be not a minister of the letter. Don't take this literally. Galatians 4, 24 and 4, 25, the Apostle Paul says the Old Testament is an allegory. So the whole Bible says it's symbolic. There was no talking snake. But when you have the atom, you split the atom to begin the procreation or the, uh, the manifestation of life. You introduce the physical and the mental. You have the capacity to choose, but you have nothing to choose. So now enters the snake, that which is the serpent, which is the representative of the, the human spine, which is in turn representative of the flesh or desire. So now we have a choice. We can make a choice. Okay? Now, let me tell you something about this, which is really fascinating, I think. And it will go on, and we'll continue the evolution of this as we go on in further weeks. But this is really interesting. When you talk about, quote, unquote, the person we call God, the original context and the original statement of the Bible uses the word Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. It means gods, the gods. It is plural, and it means male and female that God is not just male, but God is also female. Do you know that that is the original word in the original text, but that the church could not deal with the point of God, quote-unquote, whatever that is, of being anything but male, so Elohim was removed, the female characteristic was removed, and we have this nameless, sexless thing called God. And what is God? God is nothing more than a play on the word good. You take the O out of good, and you got God. Come over here, you got evil. You put the D in front of evil, you got the devil. This is how clever the guys were who made this uh, myth up that you and I have been following all of all. They couldn't think of anything a little more clever than that, but that's as far as they got. Okay. The point of, quote unquote, God being male and female. Remember, there's more than one God according to the Bible. I'm not saying, but remember, when this quote-unquote parable takes place and Adam and Eve falls, the Bible says, oh, what are we going to do? Man has become as one of us. Us? Who's us? Elohim. More than one God. It's in the Bible. See? Now, 
It also says that let us create man in our image. There's two things to look for in Genesis. Man has become as one of us, God. And let us create man in our image, God. But remember the name Elohim, which is male and female, has been removed by the church and replaced with this thing called God. So, you know, that is done deliberately. In the, when we talk about God being male and female, the Bible confirms this. And if you look in Genesis chapter 5, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1, it says this is the book of generations of Adam. In the day that God made man, in the likeness of God made he him. In other words, we are made in God's likeness. And this is what it says. Male, verse 2, Genesis 5, verse 2. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam. No Eve, no Cain and Abel, no Garden of Eden. It says Adam begat a son named Seth, and that was the end of it. But male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Because of what's being spoken of, Atom. All right. So, we have this point of, quote-unquote, God being Elohim, male and female. And so what we've developed then here is from the Adam, the splitting of the Adam, the introduction of the male and female aspect of every human being, uh, the ability then to choose, and then we get to the matter of choice, which is represented by the serpent, who is introduced as the additional part of the psychological drama that we are involved in here. Okay. Now, we, I think, have, to this point, seen a little bit of the evolution uh, that Eve here, is actually not a person, but Eve, the name Eve, represents a part of you, which is the thought part. In other words, if you were to take and say, well, you have the ability to think, the Bible has named your ability to think, or the thought process, Eve. So that's thought, okay? Now, the physical process, where you act things out, you know, the physical manifestation that, that you do things, and we needed a name for that in our little drama, so that's called Adam, which is, of course, a play on that word Adam. But that's the physical. So then what happens? The serpent, which represents the spine and desire, okay, becomes, a, 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 um, approaches, if you would, first of all, what part of us? The desires that we have develop where first? In our mind. They become a thought. We think about these things. And so Eve is the one who's involved. That's why the woman or Eve will always be the one who uh, eats the apple or devours the food first, because before anything can happen, it must first originate as a thought. Okay? So then the serpent comes along, which means we have communication from the physical realm of the body which gives us a desire to have, a desire to do, a desire to be. We then begin to think. That's Eve. The thought process begins. Once we decide that we are going to do the particular thing that we're thinking of, then Eve has eaten the fruit. It has nothing to do with a real woman eating real fruit. Nothing whatsoever. It's simply an allegorical reference to the part of your mind that takes up on the desire that comes to it from the flesh or from that which is a representative of the flesh, the spine, which is the serpent. So once then that you have decided, this is something I'm going to want to do, then Eve has eaten the fruit, okay? Now that in and of itself does not consummate the act. Along comes Adam. When the thought process passes the thought process, over to the physical, then the deed is done. It's acted out. It can happen in any way. I mean, you might say, uh, I'm, going to make a, I'm going to make a little uh, model airplane. Okay. The thought process is the plane. This is how I'm going to make the plane. That's Eve. Now you decide and you go ahead and you start to work on it and it comes out as a plane because Eve has passed the thought on Adam works on it, it comes out in the physical realm, and the manufacturer there is the plane. It is the desire, however you speak of it. The problem that we have here, and this is where 
the confusion comes in because it is confusion. Adam and Eve, the physical and the mental process of the body, are instructed to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Now, the reason for that is because the human mind on the left side provides us with good, good ideas. You go visit somebody in the hospital. Um, you go take the kids to a ball game. You're taking the kids scouting. You buy a present for your wife. All good. But there's also in that same tree, which is the left hemisphere of the brain of the carnal mind, evil. You know? You, uh, you took somebody to the hospital, or you were going to visit somebody at the hospital, but on the way there you knocked over somebody's mailbox with your car and you didn't stop to tell them, or uh, you rode up on somebody's lawn, or you banged into somebody else's car because you weren't paying the attention, you ran a red light, you got a ticket for speeding. I mean, in, along with the good is the evil, and then they mix together, and what comes is confusion. So what we're admonished to do is not to eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, what we're admonished to do is not to take that which comes from the desires of the left hemisphere of the brain or the carnal mind, but to seek ourselves back to that which is the right side or back to the garden, which only can happen through meditation. And the way we do that is as we enter into meditation, we bring those cycles, those brain cycles down from 26 cycles which are in beta to 14 cycles which are in alpha, to 8 cycles which are in theta, to 4 cycles which are in delta through the process of meditation. So then we start to depend on receiving instruction from the right side or the right hemisphere of the brain rather than ins receiving instruction from the left side or the left hemisphere of the brain. That's what this is all about. Okay. So when, of course, we are now in confusion because we have taken from the left side, we're no longer in the Garden of Eden because we're no longer functioning from the right hemisphere of the brain. 90% of your brain is dormant as far as you're using it. You can use the left side. You don't use the right side because it's dormant. Because that's the Garden of Eden where we were kicked out of. And the reason we were kicked out of the garden is because we chose to depend on the left side. And people still do, even in religion. It's all emotional because they chose to deal with the left side. And the only way that you can open yourself to the right side is to obey Jeheshua the Christ. His name wasn't Jesus. His name was Jeheshua. We might as well use, let's make a pledge on this program. Let's, let us make a pledge. I mean, the man went through all kinds of hell. I mean, he gets killed and all of this stuff. and every, At least, I think, Christianity should make a new pledge and say, let's Let's use the guy's right name. Let me, let me spell his name for you, so that way you can use it. And the next time you go to church, say, let's not call him Jesus anymore, because that's a Greek name, and the guy wasn't Greek. That's made up. And don't tell me that Jesus is the derivative of, or, uh, of the word uh, Jehoshua, because it's not. It isn't. Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, is a Greek word, which means the sun god, and it totals up to the na number of the celestial sun god, 888, which is Greek mythology. That's the name that's used. I saw a guy in television say, and we accept this in the mighty name of Jesus. The only problem is it wasn't the guy's name. So why don't we just get off for a minute here and make a pledge. Let me give you his name. I mean, you know, you would think somebody in church would tell you, but that's, you know. It's J-E-H-O-S-H-U-A, Jehoshua. Or you can say Jehoshua. That's his name. Now, it's very Jewish, and of course we... That wasn't allowed in the formation of the church, so we changed it to a Greek name. But if his name is mighty, and there is power in his name, and there is healing in his name, you might start getting it if you use the right name. <laughs> it's a little late, but I mean, you know, better late than never. His name wasn't Jesus. There never was a Jesus who lived in the Holy Land, Palestine, Israel. That's a Greek name. All right? And so we turn around, give the guy a Greek name, and they pray in the mighty, holy name of Jesus. What, wasn't this, is that a riot or what? I mean, is this something, the mighty name, I claim it in the mighty name of Jesus, and you got the wrong guy. You got a Greek guy. It wasn't him. His name was Joshua. <laughs> Maybe you want to start using his right name. Why don't you put a vote in your church? Tell him I said it. You know, that way they'll sure to do it. But I mean, you know, just say, we want to get together and we want to change the name. We don't want to use the name. You know what? The amazing thing is, we, you couldn't do it. it his name wasn't Jesus. Everybody knows his name wasn't Jesus. It's in all the Christian dictionaries that his name wasn't Jesus. It was Jehoshua. But, you know, nobody can change it because it's tradition. And that's why Jehoshua the Christ said, you make the law of God of no effect by your tradition. Wow. 
Good stuff, right? Okay. So anyhow, we, uh, we're no longer dwelling in the right side. We're now off in the left side, and all of, the, all of the hell starts. And the next time that we get together, we'll explain about Cain and Abel. So what did we do? Okay, real quick. We got to the atom, right? We split the atom. We developed the process of thought and the physical, which was Eve and Adam. Okay? We then developed the question of choice and desire with the talking snake. <laughs> okay? And now we make a choice. We find ourselves over to the left hemisphere of the brain. And when we introduce Cain and Abel down the road, we'll introduce to you the evolution process of the mind to develop itself into that which we call conflict. That which goes on in your head all the time. Conflict, conflict, conflict. The left side and the right side screaming at one another. Okay, so your book of Genesis in the early part of your Bible has nothing to do with what is said. It's allegorical and it's psychological. It's cosmic psychology talking about the evolutionary process that developed, developed the human mind, the human brain, and the human psyche into the position where we are in now. We're finally in this new age. We're starting to grope our way back to the Garden of Eden, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. Okay, the New Age Christian Village 